Hello and welcome to your number one tech show. This is Take on Tech. Today's show is centered around digital rights and inclusion. And apart from that, we are going to keep you updated on tech news and also a very interesting tech of the week feature just for you. So you are rightly tuned in and the hashtag to use is Take on Tech. My name is Stephanie Ayeta. In tech news, we tell you of the Digital Rights Inclusion Forum that recently concluded whose theme was around building sustainable internet for all. And internationally, we let you in on the Indian Startup Gala that exploded into a scandal. More details into this in our tech news roundup. The 10th Digital Rights Inclusion Forum, GIF23, kicked off in Nairobi, setting the ball rolling for a three-day conference, Paradigm Initiative, which is a leading pan-African digital rights and inclusion organization, has convened GIF since 2013. The forum, whose theme was building a sustainable internet for all, brought together representatives from government, non-governmental organizations, academia, media, funding partners, the United nations, the technical community, and the private sector within the digital ecosystem. The sessions focused on, among other themes, internet shutdowns, universal service fund utilization, data protection, content moderation, and censorship. It started with a high-level panel discussion comprising Ms. Emma Inamutila Theophilus, who is the Namibia Deputy Minister for Information, Communication, and Technology. Also, Ms. Grace Kedaiga, the CEO and convener of Kicktonet. We had Mr. Jibenga Sisan, who's the executive director of Paradigm Initiative, and Mr. Vladimir Gare, the advocacy director of Derekos Digitalis. The panel was unanimous on the need for sustainable internet and balanced regulation across the continent. Ms. Theophilus, who spoke about the level of internet penetration in Namibia, pointed out the huge cost involved in developing infrastructure and the need for government and political will. Ms. Kizaiga emphasized the need for multi-stakeholder collaboration and joint convenings in delivering internet access. On his part, Vladimir stressed the importance of internet access, adding that people want high-quality, affordable, and secure internet connectivity. The internet is expensive and limited, and that the stakeholders need to acknowledge and address internet connectivity gaps. Jibenga also urged stakeholders to contribute towards efforts aimed at ensuring internet accessibility. The event was sponsored by the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Ford Foundation, Wikimedia Foundation, Google, Open Technology Fund, and the Global Network Initiative. In March, hundreds of budding entrepreneurs descended on Noida, a suburb of India's capital Delhi, to attend a three-day convention that dubbed itself World's Biggest Funding Festival. However, this turned out to be a disappointment to the eager startup founders who looked forward to rubbing shoulders with business leaders at the World Startup Convention, WSC. Within hours of the event kickstarting on March 24th, things plunged into chaos. Many participants and and some sponsors have alleged that they were lured with false promises and cheated. According to WSC's website, top Indian politicians, including Federal Transport Minister and Health Minister, were among the chief guests. Other guests included state chief ministers and ministers, all from the governing party. BJP, the publicity material, said that 1,500 venture capitalists, 9,000 angel investors, and 75,000 startups were expected to participate. It was billed as a platform to meet potential customers, network, and pitch directly to investors. Mr. Chauhan, co-founder of the Bike Servicing and Repair App, 
Apna mechanic spent $244.4 to buy tickets for himself and four colleagues. They arrived with a presentation for potential investors. The excitement, however, didn't last long. He said hours went by and they barely saw any investors. A scheduled virtual address by the Federal Transport Minister, Mr. Gadkari, had been cancelled and a rumble of discontent was spreading among participants. It became chaotic. By the end of the day, a group of 19 entrepreneurs, including Mr. Chauhan and Mr. Jain, had filed a police complaint accusing the organizers of cheating and breach of trust. Co-founders of Co-founder PVT Limited, which organized WSC, denied all allegations, saying that a group of disruptors with an anti-BJP agenda had ruined the event, forcing them to call the police. Disgruntled participants have written scathing posts about the experience at the WSC on social media and left negative Google reviews online. Ever thought of using a sustainable, eco-friendly and cheaper solution to your cooking? Well, here in our Tech of the Week feature, we let you in on Eco Briquette, which is a better alternative to charcoal. Let's listen in. According to the World Health Organization, globally, around 2.4 billion people use inefficient stoves or polluting cooking methods, including kerosene and coal. Michael Duncan, the founder of Chisa Eco Briquette, is keen to challenge this population. His company is exploiting an abundant source of combustible material in South Africa, macadamia nut shells. The country is the world's biggest producer of macadamia nuts, so there's plenty of shells going spare. Since 2021, Mr. Duncan's firm has been taking some of them, compressing them and turning them into briquettes. He says Chisa Eco Briquettes are an environmentally friendly alternative to charcoal. Often, charcoal manufacturing in Africa is small scale, emits more carbon dioxide than it needs to and contributes to deforestation. Mr. Duncan says that his Eco Briquettes can protect forests by replacing charcoal and wood with a product completely derived from a waste biomass product. And, according to Mr. Duncan, briquettes made from macadamia shells can add to the barbecue experience. He says, when you have a macadamia nut shell burning, it lets out a wonderful aroma which goes on the food you're cooking, which gives it a different taste. Mr. Duncan plans to expand, particularly into export markets, which he says tends to be less cost-effective, which he says tends to be less cost sensitive and particularly value eco-friendly products. Beyond the barbecue, more environmentally friendly cooking methods could tackle a much bigger problem. Ziwa Hillington is the managing director of Green Bioenergy in Uganda, which makes more efficient cooking stoves and briquettes from waste like charcoal dust, cassava and maize crops. He says those briquettes produce no smoke or soot when burned, so are a much healthier option. They also help mitigate deforestation. In addition, making the briquettes provides employment. Perhaps the biggest advantage is cost. Mr. Hillington says they can be between 20% and 40% cheaper than charcoal or other cooking fuels. We have now gotten to Tech Talk, where we join Grace Gathiger and the Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative, who are going to talk about the Digital Rights and Inclusion Forum that recently concluded. Let's take a look. Welcome to the interview section of Take on Tech, a weekly program that brings you technological concepts and issues and breaks them down in an untech way. Now, there is an event that takes place in Africa every year. It's an annual event, and this is the Digital Rights and Inclusion Initiative, DRIFT. DRIFT 2023 took place in Nairobi. In today's interview, we speak to the Executive Director of Paradigm Initiative, the host of DRIFT 2023, 
and he will tell us everything about Digital Rights 2023. What is it? What are the issues? And what has been concluded? My name is Grace Gidega. Welcome. Well, so I'm not exactly the main person. Mm -hmm. I lead the organization, yeah. but uh, to be honest, the credit goes to my colleagues who actually, you know, put the plans together. Uh, DRIF is Digital Rights and Inclusion Forum. Uh, we started in 2013 and we used to call it the Internet Freedom Forum because it was just about internet freedom. Uh, but at some point, we realized that the internet is not everything digital. There's a lot more to digital than just the internet. So we decided then to do two things, rename it as digital and also involve inclusion. So it wasn't just about digital rights, it's digital rights and inclusion forum. So that's, that's where DRIF uh, came from. And we just concluded the 10th edition of it. Uh, we have excuses of, oh, there's a, there are elections. We don't want people to share the results. Why would you not want people to share the results? Yes, we know there are other challenges, and these are some of the other challenges that we face. Uh, we're now in an era where some of the excuses that are given include valid problems. There's online gender-based violence. It is not enough reason to shut down the entire internet, but it happens. A lot of women, I mean, we've done surveys uh, since 2015, and what we've seen is that there are women who say they can't come online because there are trolls who come for them, who say silly things and try to get them offline. Uh, we have challenges with also policy environments. Uh, there are many countries, uh, we were just having conversations in, in Lusaka a few weeks ago, and the government was announcing you know, the removal of certain laws, including the law on insults to the president. And it's funny, because why on earth would that law exist in the first place? Many of these things are colonial. These were the things that the, colonial, you know, the you know, colonizers used to oppress us as Africans. And we still keep these laws in the name of protecting you know, either people uh, who are in power or things like that. And I think it's important for us to enjoy freedom of expression. But of course, there's responsibility. And the reason I say that is because we're not an organization that says, oh, anyone should go and say anything and they get away with it. No. There are things that are already established as criminal. There are things already established. Almost all of our countries have cybercrime laws. And these cybercrime laws, we've categorically stated what will happen when someone does the wrong thing. And we believe in justice either way. If someone does something wrong, of course they should be corrected and they should go through the, you know, the legal process. But at the same time, we can't set up legal environments that do not promote you know, innovation. I, I always say that there are two options for Africa. We can focus on repression, as far as the internet is concerned, or we can focus on innovation. We can't do both. Nobody does both well. People say, oh, for example, there are countries like China that do that. But the reality is that when you look at those exceptions, you realize that you can't copy them. So a country needs to decide, do we want economic development using the internet? Or do we want to worry about the small things and the small fights and then shut everything down? My guess is that, and you know, numbers from the last 11 years show this, when you plot a graph between internet rights, digital rights, and freedoms and innovation against uh, GDPs of countries, you find out that there's a correlation between freedom and development. And, and I think this is really important because these are the challenges we've seen. And in solving these challenges, we can then get to a sustainable future and, of course, a sustainable internet for all. 55 countries, that's a lot. I mean, to be honest, at times I wish we worked more together uh, you know, one of my favorite musical artists says uh, something about, I want to go to South Africa without having to get a visa. I think we, we don't cooperate enough across the continent. And I say that because there's so many good things that we can learn from each other. Because countries are unique. Unfortunately, what is more popular are the things that go wrong in certain countries. I mean, because at times, you know, they say bad news sells and things like that. But I think that many African countries have a lot to learn from each other. And I'll give you a very practical example. When Kenya started having a conversation about Uduma Namba uh, and, you know, data protection and all that, the whole continent was watching. The beautiful thing was that when Kenya decided to have an independent data protection commissioner, that sent a message to every other country. Because there were countries who had appointed commissioners before then that were not independent, that were basically at the beck and call of the executive. But when Kenya did that, it was a good example. And I'm absolutely certain that it influenced many of the countries that are now beginning to do the same thing. The same thing happened with, with, you know, with, with Ghana. 
uh, they were going towards elections, and the same thing, of course, happened, you know, in Kenya when you were going towards elections, and there was, you know calls and people were saying things like, oh, maybe the internet will be shut down, or maybe they will not want us to use the internet during that. And people were definitely, con you know, really concerned because the history of elections before then, uh, either in Chad or in Zimbabwe or in Uganda, or even with the Twitter shutdown in Nigeria, which wasn't exactly election related, but was very close to it. People were concerned. But when Ghana and Kenya did not shut down the internet, that sent a message that you can have terribly contested elections, just like your own elections, the Nigerian elections, are still, be cont are still be contest contested. There are people who are not happy. Oh, well, this person I wanted to win did not win. This person won. I don't think they should be. Go to court. Speak up. Do the things you want to do. And in some cases, you know, you know citizens have peaceful protests. That's democracy. But the reality is that, that Kenya and Ghana were able to go through that process without shutting down the internet, then sends a strong message that you don't really have to shut down the internet for you to have you know, conversations about like tense elections. Tensions are part of a budding democracy. Unfortunately, we have to make up our minds. Do we want to do this thing called democracy or not? If we want to, then people will always disagree, even if everybody chooses to vote for one person. There'll be that one person in the country, most likely the other candidate, who will not vote for the person everybody votes for. So there will still be dissent. I'm so excited to talk about the gains because I'm, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an advocate. Uh, and, and because of that, majority of the time, people share information with me about what's wrong. Uh, you know, we need to sue this government. We need to appeal to this government. We need to uh, do this and do that. But for me, the beautiful thing is I look at a snapshot of Africa as a continent. Uh, Paradigm Initiative has offices in, in seven countries, including Kenya. And all of, this, all of these countries where, where we have team members and where we work, and we work beyond those countries, but I look at all the seven countries and I put them in three buckets. There's still those countries that are still in the same place they were 10 years ago, unfortunately. Uh, some of the policies have even regressed, unfortunately, but they're not my worry. My excitement is that there's a second group of people who have made progress. It's not 110,000 percent, but they've made some progress. They've had difficult conversations. They've looked at their policies. They've expunged the things that are you know, a bit weak. They've strengthened their laws. They've increased internet access, which I think is absolutely important. My argument is that the fourth industrial revolution is Africa's last opportunity to be part of the global economic debate. Right now, we're not there. It's the reason why many times you find Russia, China, the UK, the US, Europe, and others hosting summits and inviting our heads of states to come and sit with them. I believe strongly that Africa as an economic entity can dictate the terms of our economic future. We're the youngest continent where the continent with an increasing population, but not just increasing population, but increasing population with a median age of 18, that is a major workforce. There are countries in the world right now where the workforce is already depleted, where they need to import people from other continents to meet their quota for the workforce. But we don't have that problem. We are increasing in numbers, but these numbers are a major advantage if we manage them well. And I think the major advantage is one of the things I love about the third category of countries. These are countries that have sincerely adopted three things. Number one, they know the, the power of data. Because they know the power of data, they have data protection policies that are absolutely fantastic. I mentioned you know, Kenya's journey here earlier. But before Kenya, there was Ghana. Ghana decided, listen, this open data thing for us is not about keeping it open because it sounds good but because there are economic opportunities. We want young people to be able to take health data, build apps around that, and become millionaires and billionaires. And guess what? When the young people become billionaires, where do they pay taxes? Of course they pay taxes. Well, hopefully they're registered in your country, so they pay taxes in your country. So data is one advantage that we have had as a continent. And boy, we do generate data. If you go on TikTok, go on Facebook, and you look at all of the content, I mean, there's a reason why a Senegalese was the most popular person on Instagram and TikTok for a long time, the Senegalese guy, because we know content. I could sit here, and he doesn't even talk. He just does, and people begin to laugh. That is data. That is something that we've taken advantage of. The second thing is our people. 
There are countries that I'm very proud of that have deliberately focused on not just the technology side of things, but on the people side of things. Uh, where you have young people, the Namibian Deputy Minister for ICT and Digital Economy was at the opening panel here at DRIF. When she said on the stage that she became an MP, I think, I think 20, 23, uh, three years ago, everybody was calculating. So she's 26. Now that is a gain in Africa. Many years ago, we thought it was only the elders around the table, but now we have young men, young women, and anyone who chooses to identify otherwise who are doing amazing things. You've heard a lot about investments in Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt because of tech startups. This is about people, and this is something Africa has done well. In fact, a Nigerian guy just bought a club uh, in Europe uh, because they didn't have enough money from people who were interested in buying the club because he's very interested in football. Why was he able to do that? He started a company called Paystack, you know, and built the company. It was bought by Visa for $200 million, and now he has money to fulfill his passion and he's still making more money from, from, from doing the work. So there's first of all data, there's the people, but I think the third thing that I'm most excited about you know, in terms of our progress is conversations, difficult conversations. Many years ago, as an activist, I never had a chance to talk to the people that would typically arrest me, the Secret Service. You know, when they see me, the first thing they're thinking is arrest him. He's going to say something bad. He's going to say something on national TV that the president shouldn't hear. But now, we have conversations. In fact, over the last two years and for the next three years, we're actually training judges at Paradigm Initiative. We're training security officers, including some people who, when I'm training them, I make a joke and say, oh, by the way, you've arrested me before, but now let's discuss the future. Because we all look at the elephant in different ways. And I'm in Kenya, so I should use the elephant as an example. Uh, that's one of the reasons I love Kenya, by the way, you know, the big five. When you touch the tail of the elephant, you think you're holding a snake. When you touch the side of the elephant, you think you're holding a wall. When you touch the nose, you think, oh my God, whatever this is, it is big. And guess what? If you don't look at the other person and ask them what are they touching, you will argue. And you will all be right. You will be holding a wall because it is like a wall. You will be a snake because it's like a snake. But if you don't talk to each other across silos, there will be a problem. Africans have started talking to each other. And I love that. It's difficult. At times, you still have conversations and the security guys are like, uh, yes, I hear what you say, but I don't agree. But at least we're talking. And conversations always help with resolution of problems and becoming a better people generally. The interview section of Take on Tech takes a short break. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue with the conversation with Benga Session, who is the executive director of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria. Please continue following us on our social media handles. And that's at KBC Channel 1 across all media handles. Welcome back to the interview section of Tech on Tech in which we are talking about Digital Rights and Inclusion Forum, DRIFT 2023. Three things. Number one, we talked a lot about our annual report you know, during these conversations. And one of the things we've highlighted in that report is the Universal Services Fund. 22 out of the 24 countries that we surveyed have Universal Services Funds. It's basically money that government receives to be able to provide digital services to the interland. Many of the countries that we surveyed have not done this. And our challenge to governments is restructure. First of all, audit your universal services funds. Many of you have a lot of money that you're not spending. Because at times, you know, there's a politics of, oh, why should this ministry have this much money and things like that. But use those universal services funds to connect your people to the internet. The more people are connected to the internet, the more opportunities they get. And this is not about language. They don't have to speak English or even Swahili. As long as they're able to offer a service that the other person on the other side of the internet can understand and use, they can make money. That's why the old gig economy, the digital economy, makes sense. So that's the first thing I'll say to governments. The second thing I'll say to governments is to cooperate 
a lot more. Because we also do development projects, there are countries, I mean, in many countries when we get to talk to government representatives, they're very happy because we're investing our own resources in those countries. Uh, I mean, I could decide to take that $100,000 from your country and take it to another country. I mean, my board would approve it. But if I'm bringing it to your country and we want to work together, then we should cooperate. But in some countries, uh, admitting that something has gone wrong and allowing civil society to come and fix the problem is something that many countries cannot do. Such that, you know, because if someone comes for, with intervention in education, you first of all have to admit that our education is not perfect before the person can make an intervention. We've done that in health. We do it all the time with Bill Gates Foundation and other foundations. We know we've, we're struggling with health and then we allow them to come in. But we don't like doing that when it is African organizations pointing this thing out. And to me, I'm shocked because the people who know the continent better are those who are born here, understand this place, have lived the problems. The work I do today at Paradigm Initiative, I started Paradigm Initiative in 2007 because of a personal experience. Because I was denied access to a computer in my secondary school, my third year in secondary school, and I decided when I learned how to use one that, you know what, I will gain access, I will buy a computer, which I didn't do for a very long time, unfortunately, and when I learned how to use it, I will teach other people. And I started teaching young people, and that's how, 16 years later, it's now a Pan-African organization born out of one child's pain. We need to do better with cooperation between government and the private sector. It is okay. Vulnerability is fine. You can admit that we are not perfect with education. We are not perfect with internet. We're not perfect with policy. We need your help. And the third, I think is really important, is for governments to celebrate their own successes. Um, yes. Uh, government has ministries of information, there's a lot of, you know, people say, oh, government has the power of propaganda and things like that. But I think we don't celebrate our own African successes enough. Many times you read about that young woman who started a small company in Kisumu and it became a global phenomenon because she was interviewed by um, Oprah. You hear that on Oprah's show on CNN. Why is the government not announcing human capital gain as an opportunity? And I think this is where we miss it. Because when that young woman is only celebrated by opera and foreign media, she feels an affiliation to them. And so when you then invite her to come and talk to other young people, she's not talking to them based on the fact that she's appreciated in her own country. Like they say, a prophet has no honor in his or her own home. I think Africa needs to change that story. We need to celebrate our own, because the more we celebrate them, I mean, look at Mo Ibrahim. Mo Ibrahim made all his money in Sudan, and today he has a difficult relationship with his own country. Why should that be? This is a man who is helping the entire continent, helping the entire world, and between Sudan and South Sudan, you literally see people saying, oh, maybe there's a political thing and things like that. So we need to celebrate our own better. And I honestly think that the government knows how to do this already. The way they celebrate three kilometers of roads when it is built, they can celebrate young people who make innovative you know, things happen the same way. Africa has no business playing the ostrich. We cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend that we can't see the problems. And I'm saying this not just to government, to everyone. Government, civil society, private sector, individuals, people who hold power, people who want power. We can't afford to do that. We need to bring our head out, address the issues through difficult conversations. It will be tough. People may stand up on their seats, almost fighting each other. But when we realize that the future in the next, how many years? 2063 is the African Union target, AU 2063 plan. 2063 is only 40 years away. 40 years from now, if Africa will be a different country, Wakanda forever, if Africa will be that kind of country in 55 places, then we need to bring our heads out, have difficult conversations, invest in our people, invest in especially the weakest, the people who we typically don't invest in. You look at majority of the decisions made across the continent, and you look at the percentage of women in politics, and you ask yourself, wh why should anybody be surprised that policies are, the constitution is male? 
he shall, he shall, there's no she shall, because there was no woman involved to so say she shall. Uh, and I think this is the reason why we need to invest in women, we need to invest in especially abled, we need to invest in young people, so that in 2063, we don't keep having the same set of conversations. That brings us to the end of the interview section of Take on Tech, where we had Benga Session from Paradigm Initiative Nigeria, and he's spoken to us about the Digital Rights and Inclusion Forum 2023. Continue watching us, and please follow our social media handles. My name is Grace Dudaiga. Keep watching. <music>